Hey, little Patty. Here you are, my buddy. Hey, how's my little bear doing? Got some treats for you. Here you go. You got the most beautiful face. Hey, how are you doing, man? You're about to experience something rare, something controversial, and yet there's no question this is something extraordinary. Good boy. Come on, little Patty, here you go. Throughout history, there have been stories handed down to us, stories of unusual connections between man and animal. Some are true, some we aren't so sure, but you won't meet a man more true than Michael Scheibler. Want to go digging in there, eh? We do offer rides. Bareback bear rides, $500 for a female and $1,000 for a male. That includes the coffin. Unexpected journey. It's more than a connection with nature. It's a connection with the past and a connection with the power of redemption. shores of the Rainy River in northwestern Ontario lies the little town of Emo, population of about 1,300, including Michael and Betty Scheibler, a dog, a cat, a raccoon, a pigeon, a wolf, lots of deer, and of course, the bears. In 2002, Michael and Betty bought 320 acres of this land. They had big plans. Michael, a landscaper by trade, dreamed about building a golf course here and a motocross track for bike enthusiasts. Something to support themselves and live out their dream of living off the land. But little did they know, there was something unusual about this place. They got a hint shortly after they moved in. One day, uh, Betty was here with her youngest daughter. We were looking at things. We were renovating and you know, trying to make it our home. And so we were in the bedroom. I just put in the screen door, because it's plastic screen, and this great big male bear is walking up. And her, her daughter, <coughs> Trisha, was like, hey, Dad, you And it's a big male bear, like the size of these guys you saw here this morning. And I'm going, oh, you guys. And, she, and the bear comes, and, <laughs> and he sticks his nose up against a plastic screen, okay? And Trisha, she just kind of sticks her knee over to him against the screen and he's sniffing her knee and I'm going, you guys are nuts. <laughs> hey, okay, so we put some food out for him. So now this bear's been fed. Trisha goes home and Betty goes to work. So now guess what? I gotta feed the bears. I know nothing about feeding bears. I got no training. I just, there you go. I just throw it, there you go. It was my introduction into the bears. The next year 13 showed up and a bunch of deer we had in the wintertime. We're up to 7,200 deer a day in the wintertime here, and we're up to almost 60 bear now. <laughs> it is really neat, really. Um, I've always had a love for animals, always. And, like, my dad always brought animals home that he found orphaned or wounded or whatever. And so I kind of grew up in it. In October of 2003, we got a phone call from, uh, from friends of ours in Stratton, about 25 miles west of here, that this little cub was up in their crab apple tree for two weeks. Some idiot had shot the mother. So he was the first cub we rescued, brought him over here. I got a picture of him 50 minutes later by the pond there.
the day we brought him home, I was sitting at the cage that we had him in, talking to him softly, calling, telling him, you know, what a cute little baby you are, you know, and I was trying to feed him stuff through the, the mesh wire. And of course he was scared and he was growling and he was making sounds and, you know, he, he didn't want to have nothing to do with me. From that time on, even like the following year when he came back out of hibernation, I was the one that seemed to go out and feed him. Mike got some pictures of it and whatnot. But uh, yeah, it, it just seemed like the two of us connected more so than me and any of the other animals that were here. He still holds a special spot in my heart. He always will. I know he's just a really nice bear. He's he's so passive. He he won't get into fights with anybody, and he, no matter how hungry he is, if another bear comes, he wants to join him. He just lets him. He won't chase them off like the other bears. He will. He's one bear that will not. I wake up in the morning. Sometimes I wake up to the sounds of the bears outside. That's what wakes me up. Sometimes there's one up as high as five, six bear out there eating, and it is really neat. It's better than waking up to uh, traffic sirens, stuff in the city. It's peaceful, it's calming, it's, it's cool. He was the first one to take a donut out of my mouth when he was little. As he got bigger, every fall he'd bring cubs with him. I mean, it's odd that a male bear would bring cubs. They're supposed to kill them, everything I'd ever learned. And one year he brought five cubs, either they're orphaned or abandoned. We don't know where he picked them up. He'd bring them to the troughs. They ate, he, he laid down while they ate, then he'd eat, then they all go. Betty, my wife, wondered if uh, perhaps he knew what it was like to be an orphan. We, we don't know what's going on in his head, but um, it was those instances and other things that were happening here why, um, I remembered somewhere back in my youth, either hearing a scripture or having read it, something about a bear and a calf and a lion and a kid. And so I started researching in my Bible and I found Isaiah 11. And so I believe that this was a foreshadow of what's coming. It's not here yet, but it's a blueprint of what's coming in that day when all will be at peace. The lion will lay with the lamb, the bear will graze with the calf, as I've got written there. and a child shall lead them. So I'm like a child, I'm leading them because I, I'm, I, I may be 58 years old, but my head, I don't think it's gone past my teens yet. <laughs> I know. Let's go get destiny, yeah. Yeah, Michael calls his little piece of paradise the Isaiah 11 Wildlife Rescue and Rehab Sanctuary. Isaiah 11 refers to an ancient prophecy from scripture. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat, the calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear, their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like the ox. Michael believes that this ancient prophecy might just be coming true right here in his backyard. That's pretty cool, these two playing here. <laughs> Sanctuary is not just in the name of this unusual place. It's a special word for Michael. A sanctuary for the injured, the abandoned, the orphaned. Well, every year, the third weekend in August, uh, they have what's called the Emo Fair. And uh, I get a call the day that they're setting up from this guy telling me he's got a raccoon he's been carrying with him for two months. He's trying to find a place to, to bring her because they just live in the trailer with him, traveling all over the place. And um, wondered if we could take care of her. So I said, I'll be right down, picked her up. Heard the story of uh, what they found in a campground, almost dead, just barely able to, to navigate at night. Figured the mother had been hurt and uh, he did a great thing. He did call the government. They insisted that it was illegal for him to have her and that they, he bring her down so they can give her a needle, put her down. He said, no, it ain't happening. And uh, so I picked her up. And I told the, the daughter who was 15, I told her that I'm gonna call her destiny because of all the different things that had to happen, the, all the perfect timing, all these things that had to happen for her to end up here at Isaiah 11. 
that's the only name I could give her, Destiny. <laughs> it was her destiny to be here. I give her milk and uh, all of our coons for some reason just love butter tarts. So she gets that, she gets raisin bread soaked in milk and corn on the cob. She loves corn on the cob, which I guess is a natural raccoon diet. You're not going under the deck, it's a little too early. She's number 14. 14 raccoons we've uh, rescued and released. Some of them, when they got in, they were so small, their eyes were just opening. Everybody gets along here. The birds play, the, the, the bird plays with the cats, the, and everybody, it's just amazing, the stuff that goes on here. Say bye. Say bye-bye. Say bye-bye. Bye-bye. As Michael opened up his property and his heart to these animals, unusual things began to happen. A mother with three cubs shows up, and she brings the three cubs on the deck and leaves. And I'm going, I don't believe this is happening. Why would this strange bear bring her three cubs here and I'm bottle feeding them or fight their, you know, or, or treats and then 20 minutes later she comes and all she does is eat out of my hand too. What is going on here? And then, and then all these other, I'm, all these things that happen, what is going on here? I got no training for this. I don't have any degrees or initials in front or behind my name. Like what is going on here? That's why I call it as A11. A male bear is not supposed to share cake with a, with cubs. Well, I got photographs. There he is, big, big male, sharing a cake with three cubs and the mom. This is just one of the trails I blasted through here. Are many walking trails. My wife and I used to walk all the time around the property. And and uh, the other thing that I, I noticed uh, about the bears is how sociable they are and how they remember each other from generation to generation. Sometimes they'll be separated from the the fall before, and they'll come together for the last couple of months to remember, oh, there's food here. And all of a sudden they'll show up and there'll be a little bit of a nattering, but then you'll see them going slowly towards each other, sniffing noses, be eating, and they romp and play together. And I, I know who they are. I'm going, well, you're the generation before. This is your stepsister or your stepbrother or something, whatever, eh? And um, so I know when one of these are killed, a whole bunch of them are affected by it. I see it when there's one that arrives sick they seem to sense there's something wrong with this bear and they'll do a, uh, like a protection to make sure it's getting food. They'll back off and let it eat. <clears throat> oh, there's one sitting right there. Hey, there we go. Oh, that, 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 that's scared. Milo. Sorry, that's Milo. Come on, Milo. See, he wasn't worried about a voice. He just wanted to hit that brush. One thing I noticed about bears, see this one here ran, not because of our voices or because they saw us, but because I brushed against that branch. And one thing I noticed early on, is bears actually use weapons as a tool against something they want to chase away, to scare away. And what they'll do is they'll simply go in behind something like this, something like this, and they'll smack it down, just smack. See? And one time I had, when I was first starting this, I had a mum, two mums and their cubs by this one tree here. And I was going over there to feed them, and both moms charged me at the same time. Each had their own little tree, and they smacked it on the ground and, and, and warned me. And so I said, okay, here you go, and I just threw to them, and they were okay. I don't know if anybody knows this, that bears actually use tools as a weapon to help drive off something they want to chase away. So they use a tree, a small sapling, to whip it down like a whip. It just makes it sound like a whip hitting the ground. Ah, that's pretty cool. So I'm not a bear expert, but I am learning all the time different things I pick up. You have to keep my little trail clean, you know. Well, back when I was six years old, uh, I was given a choice of a little puppy in a basement in Winnipeg, because uh, we were leaving the city to move onto a farm. They took me down some stairs in the basement and there was a litter of puppies and one of them left the litter and come running over to me and I picked him up and uh, figured that's the one because he's he likes me and so I figured I'll take this one. And I called him Moxie. I have no idea where that came from. I don't even know what it means, but that's what I called him. This puppy, he brought a connection to me. He was something that loved me no matter what. 
no matter how bad I was, no matter how many spankings I got from my parents, he still licked my hand and my face. To him, I wasn't a bad person. And so I grew this really, really tight bond with this little dog that we then went to the country with. So with this puppy called Muxy, it was my first introduction to an animal that I can remember. A couple years later, we had some company from Winnipeg and we had very little food. The fact that we're even alive is a miracle because there was no welfare back then. There was no backup system. So I don't even, I remember the dog eating basically scraps, you know, potatoes. Man and dog eating potatoes. Whatever we had. So the dog was always on the verge of starvation. So I mean, so were we. And we had some people come over and this little girl went over to his dish that he had just been given some scrap food and she went over to his dish and the dog nipped her just above the eye. And of course, she come in screaming and got everybody all upset. And uh, you know, my dog's full grown now. And uh, the next thing I remember, I see my father has my dog on a rope and he's got the 22 in his hand and he's walking off into the bush. And I'm screaming and yelling and bawling my head off. I don't know what he's gonna do with it. That doesn't look good. And I watched them fade off through the meadow into the into the trees. And... You know, that day was a turning point in my life towards how I saw my father. And it wasn't good. It a, a murderous spirit rose up in me that was just so violent. And unfortunately, I took it out of my siblings. I was very cruel to them. I had a real resistance to anything that wanted to be attached to me because something was going to happen to it. It was going to either die or be killed. Running Paradise isn't easy. In fact, it's a lot of hard work. There's no such thing as Purina bear chow, so four times a week, Michael gets in his 1998 GMC pickup truck and makes the 70-mile round trip into town for food. His truck has over 270,000 miles on it. Just call him buddy and he always nods his head. Yeah, yeah, you're right, yeah, you got that right. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> it's a... Uh... 24, 24 7, 365 day a year job with this wildlife sanctuary, man. There's always food to be gathered up. The break, the one break I get is in the wintertime where I only have to go twice a week. But in the, whoa, in the summertime, I gotta go four times a week into Fort Francis to pick up this food because we're always, it's always day to day. Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah, you got it. Yeah. I hate uh, when food is wasted. I just can't stand it because of the way I grew up. We, we didn't have much. And um, it would be perfectly fine with me if there was never any stuff thrown away. It all went to people. That would be fine with me because then I know God would provide some other way for the animals. But in the meantime, while they're doing this, why take it to the dump? Might as well make some good use out of it and feed the wildlife that needs it. I mean, it sounds like a simple meal for the bears, but there's so much minerals and vitamins and stuff in bread, that's, so, that's why their coats are so healthy looking. Isn't that right, buddy? Yeah. <laughs> One time I had uh, two guys and their girlfriends here in their mid-20s, and the girls were in the back, and this whole trip through here, they were laughing and giggling, and, and I got to about there, and I turned around and said, I realize you guys aren't laughing because something is funny. You guys are laughing because you're scared stiff, right? Yeah, and then one of the girls says, she said, while we were talking about what are we going to do if a bear comes out of the woods? What, what are we going to do? I said, well, you can pray. <laughs> 
Michael's parents left Nazi Germany after Hitler's defeat and immigrated to Canada. Life was harsh and cruel, and sometimes so were they. There was uh, a lot of abuse from the parents towards us. Um, some of the abuse, I don't, I don't want to, you know, it, it's... From a young age, my sister and I were planning on running away, and actually one day we did. In the middle of winter, we packed our little sleigh, and we were running away from home. We were five and six years old, probably, or four and five, something like that. I was terrified of my father, both parents, terrified of him. My, my sister and I, we would, she's a year and a half younger than me. I'm the oldest of 11. Uh, we, if, if our parents left the house to go somewhere, we would secretively, quietly whisper in a corner of, a, of the, wherever we are, trying to come up with a plan of how we could kill them. Whether people like to hear it or not, it's, it's part of my past. It's part of the healing that my gracious Heavenly Father brought me through, through many. The first time I tried, I attempted suicide, I was nine years old. Now, can you imagine a child, you know, I, I had witnessed my uncles and my father killing an animal. What they did is they took a hammer and they hit the, the calf or the cow on the head with this hammer, it fell to the ground, and then they would, cut the throat and bleed it. Well, in my young little mind, it was the hammer blow that killed the animal. So one day while I was down in the barnyard with the, with working with the, whatever I was doing there, I took a hammer and I walloped myself right between the eyes with this hammer. And all I ended up was this great big mouse on my head and I had to lie to my mother how it got there. And a couple years later, I tried to hang myself. And I got scars on the bottom of my neck here but the rope broke. Going to uh, Fort Francis, which is like a 35 mile one way trip and picking up at the different destinations, it usually takes me uh, a couple, couple and a half, sometimes even three hours, because I might have to wait for one of the bed trucks to come back. So there goes the morning. Then I go home and I sort through everything, separate everything. There goes another hour and then another, and then feeding so another hour. So the whole morning is until noon, one o'clock is usually dedicated every two days just to get the, the food together, get it in the tubs and uh, get it sorted out, get the donuts and the cakes sorted out. And the donuts and stuff I hold back, they're just treats for, uh, Girl waved at the horns. They love the horns on the truck. <laughs> um, that, that, it, like some people might think that uh, the bears are all they're getting is the sweets and stuff, but they're just the treats. The cakes are held back for the mums with cups so they can produce milk better, and and the donuts and cookies are all held back always for when people show up. And if nobody shows up and I've got pails left over, then I just fire them out there for them. But. Uh, so the bears, they have an all-around very, very healthy diet. I get them what fruits I can when I find them. Uh, they love cabbage, they love lettuce. A lot of times it's, the stores throw it out because they're outdated. When I get milks or yogurts, cheeses, that all goes into one of the troughs there. So they have a, they have a good life. This truck has hauled a lot of stuff, man. <laughs> It's a tired old truck, though. She's got 432,805 kilometers on it. The body's falling apart now. And I want a Ford. Stay. 
This is how Michael forages for food for his beloved bears. They're only three weeks away from hibernation, and the bears need a remarkable 24,000 calories a day to store fat for winter. So Michael's made friends with the folks at local grocery stores, where they donate their excess or expired food. Michael is deeply grateful. Along the way, he never misses an opportunity to talk about his passion. Good morning. You want a, would you like a brochure? So if you want to come with your family, it's free. Come out and visit. Feed some bears if you want to. And have a good day. God bless. Three more boxes inside. A lot of times I'll get seven, eight or nine boxes. Today it's a little bit skimpy, but it's better than nothing. Every little bit helps. This is lots of fun when you're in the middle of a sleet storm, boy. Snowing, wet rain, ah. Oh. But the show must go on. I will not let these animals go hungry. I don't care what it takes. Never yet gone without them. I will go without first. And I do go without a lot. It's been uh, a really neat experience about having what the Bible would call, would call sparrow faith. The God says, the sparrow don't worry about what he's gonna eat, I feed him every day. So he says, don't worry about what you're gonna wear, don't worry about what you're gonna eat, I'll look after you. That was the plan all along, right from Adam on, that was the plan. And we're getting back to that, so I, I uh, have to remind myself every day not to worry about the supplies, not to worry about food, that somehow God is going to see it through. I've got to have sparrow-like faith that He is going to provide the manna every day. In the spring or summer, we were each given a little duckling, my sister and I, to look after. It was our job to raise it, to make sure they had food, make sure they had water, and we assumed they were our pets. And we treated them as such. We had no idea that they were gonna go on the dinner plate when they were bigger. So one day out of the blue, my mother tells me to go down and get one of the ducks and kill it on the chopping block. I was, what? You know, I mean, I didn't say that because you don't question anything. When they said something, you see, there was no communication in our house except yes or no. You don't ask, you don't question, you just do. And I remember picking up this duck, which is, you know, good size now, and walking what seemed like a long walk from the building where it was in up to the woodshed where the chopping block and the axe were, and apologizing to it profusely. And I said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to kill you, but my, I, I have, my mother wants, I don't want to do this. And so then she hollers out, the, opens the door and hollers again in German, you know. If you got this done, you, I, and I'm standing there with the duck, and I said, I don't want to do this. I don't want to kill. And then she started hurling insults at me, cutting me down, you know, being stupid and you're the band of the house. And, do I have to come and show you how to do everything? Kind of, in, kind of stuff, eh? And I refused to do it. And she come over, and she she grabbed me and just you know, like this, kind of shook me and took the duck out of my hand, put it on the block, took my hand, put it on the duck, put the axe in my hand, took her hand over my hand, lifted up the axe, and chopped its head off. The second that axe ch chopped that duck's head off, the fury, the anger, the murderous spirit in me towards my mother now was almost out of control, rage. That is not something you put a child through. A child should not have to kill anything because it'll set the tone in your spirit for years to come, years. 
the damage that something like that does. And it damaged me tremendously. I had no regard for life anymore. I came within hair sometimes of almost killing a human being. I was so enraged, you know. I had so much rage and anger. That's already when I was left home, I was in a motorcycle gang. That's why this gang took me in, because they realized after a few days of working with their president at the job site, what kind of an idiot I was. I hated everybody, I was feared of nothing. In fact, I invited death, but I dared somebody to try it, kind of thing. You gonna help me unload, buddy Koo? Hey, Cameron, you gonna help me unload? Let's go unload for the bears. They always come to help. Hey, Clyde, you come to help me too? And buddy Koo? guys come and get her come and get it lunch is being served come on come and get it come and get it Now I'll throw the bread on top, then I'll get two more uh, pails of chop, throw them on top, then I'll get the grease. Hi there. How are you? Hey there. Come and get her. Come on, here we go. Come and get it. Uh, dump this over here for them. Come on, buddy. Here you go. Now I'm going to keep this out of the mud and just put it on the grass here today. That's Panda here. Here you go. Here you are. There you go, girl. Yeah. Hey, sunflower seeds. I learned bear talk where I can talk cubs away from their mom. What I did is I listened to the mums, the noises they made, watched the cubs, see how they responded, and then I practiced. And then the first time a mum, I'd never seen before, showed up with three cubs and I practiced that sound. Even though they had donuts in the tub, the three cubs left their mom. She was going crazy. She was just pacing back and forth, grunting and snorting. The three cubs came and just sat in front of me and I hand fed them some special treats. And then I realized this actually works. You know, it's just some, some, some guttural sounds that you make with a, you know, something like that. They, you know, and the cubs know what that means. They either go up or they come down, <laughs> you know. It's amazing. I thought, I just called these three cups from their mother. This is nuts. <laughs> it was so much fun. Hey, Panda. Hey, how you doing, girl? You looking pretty good. 
pretty good. You almost ready for your big sleep? Hey, you almost ready? Getting hungry? There's, there's, there's French fries in here and gravy. This happens twice a day. <coughs> here comes your mom. Flicka, hey girl. Hey, Patty. Michael's sanctuary is a peaceful place, but it was a dark and painful journey to get here. All I wanted was love. I remember one time standing in Calgary in the, in the, at nighttime, all by myself, looking at all the lights in all these apartments and just screaming out to God if you're out there, why won't somebody just love me? Why? Why am I all alone? Why will nobody love me? Why can't I love anybody? You know, why are you always so angry at me? Because that's what I was taught in church. Lightning bolts, two by fours. It was so bad that if I hurt myself on a job, I'd just scream out, why, what did I do now? No, I just, you know. But that's the theology that I had drummed into me from my parents at home and from the church I went to. That God was a God of judgment, anger, and wrath, you know. God was wrought. You are good for nothing. You'll never amount to anything. Yeah, famous words of my parents. You know, so you start believing it. And then as the pressure builds, you just want out. You just want to check out. <laughs> I'm out of here. So I didn't care. You know, all these questions, what is going on here? I want to know, I want to have a relationship with you. I am fed up, sick and tired of religion. I want nothing to do with religion. I want a relationship with my Heavenly Father who says that He loves me. And then He helps, and He, through these animals, He's been reintroducing his incredible love for me through them and given me this love for them, this compassion, and then reopened my heart to be also compassionate and more loving to people because I'd written people off. I just had it with people, humanity. Today we're going to go down into uh, about a mile into the bush, um, an area where I first started logging with the tractor and I put brush piles together so the bears could use them as dens. And I know of at least one that's used every winter as a den, so we're going to go have a look at it. 
we should see some evidence of the hole where they go in. If there's any trampled grass or whatever, and um, you might even see a bear or two. You see where the bear have all been active, all the grass is flattened out. Look at that. They're very active in here. There's a den. There's the den. The entrance is on the other side of the... Yeah, you can see they've been flattening down trees. There's a lot of action here. There's a regular trail right through here you can see that's used. This is one of the first piles I put together for the bears. You see the hole in here? See, that's the hole there, that's where they go in. And it looks like it's been freshly used too. There's some evidence of some fresh trampling going on. Anybody home? Hello? Anybody home? It's me, come to say hi. Nobody home. But these are the kind of piles I put, I mean hundreds of these all over the place, specifically for bear. Even when I didn't know that there were bear here, I figured, if I make places, if I build it, they will come. And they did. I saw that movie, that was a great movie. Look at all the evidence of the bear, all traffic three. Look at all the flattened grass, all the trails. I noticed a few years ago when I was back here cleaning up, I saw that a lot of them, they, they, they'll go right in this tall grass and you can see the areas where they've laying down see that's pretty cool and so when they're buried into that the flies are harder to get at them it's cool it's, it's moist the swamp it's moisture so it cools them down and uh, yeah they use this the whole area is full of sleeping patches one year i know that in this grass one bear hibernated here for the winter okay. because come the spring breakup i saw in the snow tracks coming out of what looked like a den but it was just the snow that had crystallized and frozen around him in the grass. And that's when I started realizing bears don't all den up. Mm -hmm. Only the females that are pregnant den up or the ones that have their first year cubs with them for the second winter, they'll den up. All the other bears, they'll just back themselves into tall grass like this, you know, and cover themselves and then get snowed over. We have a number of bears that have half their ears, ears froze off the top part because their head wasn't properly buried. Blondie, one side of his one ear, half gone, one side, because he didn't have that head protected it too well enough. Because they'll just back themselves under a fallen balsam or something or into tall grass and just let themselves be snowed over. Bear in the tree. A couple of them, one to each tree there. Three cubs. Out the middle of nowhere. Isn't that cool? At one time, Michael could have been driving a golf cart along the green. Instead, he drives an all-terrain vehicle through the brush. He's been feeding and caring for the bears every day for over eight years. It's hard work, but it's no chore for Michael. To him, it's a reward. Oh, raccoons. Raccoons are in here. Hey, how you doing? <laughs> That's the ones we raised last year. Sorry to startle you like that. Did you get your donuts? I remember going to the Winnipeg Zoo being fascinated, but also it wasn't very long and I felt sorry for those animals being caged up in these places like this and I wanted to set them free. So. That's, 
And that's why the sign here, I have the perfect zoo, people caged, wildlife free. I couldn't understand why people would, would want to put these big animals in such a dirty little spot. They were just pacing. I knew that they were unhappy. And so when I went to the Vancouver Zoo, I, I tried to plot and I planned, how can I set them free? But I realized if I set these wolves and tigers, and they're all going to get killed because they're going to be in the city. Something they're going to be shot. I can't just release them. And so by, I turned away from going to zoos because I couldn't handle it. doing up there, eh? There you go. There you go. There you go. Come on, Anson. Come on, Lightning. Hey, Milo. Come on here. There you go. Yes, sir. So I try to study the characteristics of the bear because that's the only way to remember them. Because when they're cubs, like these cubs, okay, I might be able to tell the difference between some of them, but when they come back next spring, I'll have no clue who they are. So by paying attention to different movements that they make or how they, just even movement of the head or, or whatever, I can pin them and say, okay, the, oh, this is so-and-so. So I'm still trying to catch up from last year. Just the day I'm going, that's Otis. That's who that is, because him and Milo, I know that's Milo, because we only had a limited amount of black female cubs, and this is the right size, that's Milo. Well, then where, what happened to Otis? Well, forgetting he'd grow much bigger than her already, and he, he's now a big male, and we're, ah, you're Otis. All of a sudden, something clicked where I remembered something that he did, spending a whole summer with him. For the first two years of the sanctuary, Michael would throw food to the bears. But as Michael and the bears developed a mutual trust in each other, he began to do the remarkable, maybe unthinkable. He began to feed the bears by hand. Here you are, good girl. That's my saga. There you go, come get your cake. Oh, you want to ride the moor? There you go, come on, come and get it, there you are. Come and get it, there you go. Good girl, here she comes. Oh, stay. oh don't move, don't move. Here she comes. There you are, good girl. Good girl. That's pretty sticky stuff, eh? Oh, worse than peanut butter. Oh, my. <laughs> Ah, oh boy, oh boy, that is so rich, eh? Double chocolate German cake. Only once was I ever afraid. I went out, I took the pail of goodies, and I knelt down, and Big Blondie come up to me, and I'm feeding him, and I heard this noise from my left side, and I thought, what in the world is that? But I didn't want to take my eyes off of Blondie because making eye contact with the bear is really important. So I kept feeding him, and the, I heard the noise again, only thing it was a little bit louder, and I so much wanted to look to see what this noise was because I could see Blondie was starting to stiffen a little bit. And at the same time, the noise got louder, and Blondie then turned and looked to my left. At the same time, I took a quick look, and here come Mike out of the one building where he had three raccoons, I think it was at that time with a bunch of people, and they were making all these laughing and going on, eh? and I thought, oh, Lord, 
<laughs> Blondie's looking, and I could tell Blondie was scared, and I thought, oh, okay, if this is going to happen, it's going to happen this time, you know, because he, his whole body was stiff. He, his front legs were just planted right there. And so I just sat there, and then Mike saw me from when he came out of the building, and then he had everybody quietened down, and everybody, everything just went still. Bond, Blondie relaxed. <laughs> He didn't take no more donuts or nothing, but he just kind of relaxed and he back, took about two or three steps backwards and he went back into the bush. I thought it was a sigh of relief and I thanked the Lord for that because I knew just one swat and that was the end of me. <laughs> there, there's Blondie. Hey, Blondie. There's our alpha male. He does all the breeding. Mm. Blondie is the father to all the cubs you see, mm. all 18 of them. Looks like sometimes the black jeans were stronger than his. Hey, Panda. Hey, girl. There you go. Come on. There you go. Come on. There you go. Good girl. There you are. She's pregnant and going to have babies here next spring. Hey, how many are you going to bring me? Hmm? There you go, girl. There you are. There you are. Good girl. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. I'm coming, Tisha Pay. I'm coming. Here you go, girl. Good girl, yeah. Good girl. There you are. Good girl. Good girl. Hey, Milo. There you go, girl. Good girl. Yeah, you're such a good bear, aren't you? Yeah, you're such a good bear. Me? Yeah. A little while longer and you won't be here no more. I want to miss you again. Yeah, you bet. There you go, sweetie. There you go, buddy. There you go. Good boy. Yeah, it's coming, it's coming. There you go, Milo. Here, buddy. I don't miss you. You don't want that one? Uh, you're always so fussy, aren't you, eh? You're always such a fussy bear, you. Hey, here we go. Here we go. Here we go. Good. There you go. Hey, hey. Come on, you two. What's the matter? Your brother and sister, stop that. This is Isaiah 11. Behave yourselves. Even though bears chase each other around here, I've never yet seen one um, attack another bear with killing in mind. It's just a warning. This is my territory. This is my space. This is my food. This is my cubs. <clears throat> and, and they may just reach out sometimes and one of their claws will hook and they'll do a little rip, but that's all. They'll never have a fight to the death. But I've just never seen that. There you go, see? Oh, you're hungry today. You know bad weather's coming, don't you, eh? Might not see you for a couple days. Hey. I work as an RN at a small hospital in Rainy River, Ontario. And so, of course, it is a very stressful type of career. So as a way of de-stressing, the best way is to come out here socialize with the bears, spend time with the bears. I love it. It's a haven for my husband and I to come here. Nice and relaxing. I have had so many people that have come to see the bears that comment on how relaxed, how peaceful it is here. And they come here afraid. A lot of them has come here afraid. And we have to talk them out of the vehicle to come and see the bears. And then you can't get them to go home, you know? can't go three, four blocks down the road and see somebody else doing the same thing, eh? It, it's, yeah. Well, we have critics near and far. 
not everyone has been supportive of Michael and his special sanctuary. While many people would have no problem feeding wild birds from a bird feeder or putting food out for squirrels or any other wild animals, some critics believe it's morally wrong to feed the bears. Like, you know, about why well, you shouldn't feed the bears because we should let Mother Nature take its course. We're supposed to be caretakers. So I'm just taking care of my little spot of creation is all I'm doing. And, um, that my feeding of these animals is to help them to survive. What is so wrong with that? Why are you so upset? Well, these bears are gonna go kill people. No, they're not. I got people phoning me up, coming here and mocking me and saying, well, Michael, how many born again bears do you have now? There we go, come on, Anson, come on, Lightning. Here we go, there we go, come on, here you go. Here you go, come on, there you are. There you are, come on. There you go. There you, go. There you are. Okay. There you guys go, there you go. Good shot, there you are. Okay. There you go, good girl. Come on. This is Anson, little Missy. And that's lightning. These cubs are disciplined by their mom for a reason, to learn how to survive. They must obey. They must obey everything the mother tells them. Every, every, as I watch them, every single detail that she teaches them, it's incredible. It's all to survive, what to eat, when it's gonna be where, you know, when to run, when to attack, and to listen, what noises to respond to. It's amazing. Want some pie, Milo? Hey. Want some apple pie? Let me get it. Her and Otis were uh, abandoned by their mother in the middle of May because that bear chocolate came around and he was determined he was going to breed her even though she had just newborn cubs. <laughs> and I called them Milo and Otis because of the Walt Disney uh, show, The Incredible Journey, and I thought, these two guys are kind of lost, you know? <laughs> like all these cubs, there's, we got 18 of them here, 18 little ones this year. They're all gonna be in for a nasty shock come next spring. About May, the mothers will start driving them off. We're gonna have a whole yard full of confused cubs not knowing why their mothers don't love them anymore. The, the cubs will go up, they'll be way up on top of those trees laying out atop a bough, sound asleep. A nice little breeze, and the mom sometimes will lay down at the bottom and sleep with them, or they'll go up the tree part ways and sleep with them, or they'll just leave for hours. This year we have 18 cubs, 18 cubs. I had a bear come here so sick, about a three-year-old, and it was just about dead, but I already knew what to do because I realized it was antifreeze poisoning. I had learned from a guy when the first cub arrived, and he told me I was just starting this. This was only the second year. I, I was still throwing food. <laughs> And he said, well, it sounds like uh, antifreeze poisoning to me. <clears throat> Get uh, some raw eggs, cook up some, 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 oat, uh, some, some uh, oatmeal, and put cream in it and everything else, all the rich stuff you can get, and then separate it from its mother and give it to it. And I said, I'll get right on that. What do you mean separate the cup from its mother? You nuts. <laughs> well, I did manage to pull it off. I kept the mom and the two eating cubs busy, and then I went over and gave the pot, and he ate the whole thing. The next day he didn't show up and I thought he was done, but the next day he came and he's one of our bears. In fact, he's um, uh, bear, the bear we call uh, Big John. Yeah, Charlie came here, uh, he's been with us four years. I'm guessing he's about seven or eight. And last summer he arrived with a gunshot wound. I talked to some people about that and they said that there are guys around you who just love to gut shoot bears and let them run off and die whenever. They just, they just gut shoot them just for the sake of it, for the fun of it. Obviously, he didn't hit any vital organs, and uh, he's pulled, he's made it. Hey, Charlie? Yeah, boy. Now, this year, you can't see the entry wound anymore. The hair's all grown or the skin's growing back because it's just a small little hole. But that side was a horrible mess. What? He's about 600 pounds, this boy. Hey, hey, Smoke, there you go, buddy. 
There you go. Good boy. They're naturally grazers. I've got video of a bear going around here in the spring, just mowing my lawn beautifully. And then I started studying up on bear and going back to Genesis and realized that uh, when, when Father had made them all, everything was to be eating the grasses and the herbs of the field. So it means everything, including us, we're all vegetarians to be start with. Michael has a special bond with his animals, but of all his animals, few have touched him like a bald eagle he named Skywalker. Although it's illegal to keep a bald eagle in captivity, Native Americans are exempt. And so, when a local Indian tribe found an eagle that had been shot, the First Nations police called Michael for help. Michael began to care for the injured animal, and slowly, day by day, he nursed the eagle to life. I sat up here till about midnight journaling everything that happened into detail while it's all still fresh. July the 7th, 2010, in memory of Skywalker the Eagle. 10.30 in the morning, I received a call from Sabascon Reserve, Nestor Falls, Ontario, that there was an eagle with a bad wing trapped in the fenced area of a baseball diamond. Would I come and take him to our sanctuary? I said I'd be there as soon as possible. On the drive up, I had already decided to call the eagle Skywalker. I was finished around 7 p.m., and he was lying on his stomach, legs out back, talons, talons clenched tight, and only breathing every 10 to 15 seconds. His whole body was limp. Then I had no choice but to leave him in the Father's hands. He had created him and was well capable of restoring him if it was in his will and plan. I had done all I could do. The next morning, I climbed up the ladder and said, well, Father, let's see what you've done. And there he was, perched on top of a cedar pole, standing as proud as could be, just looking at me with those piercing white eyes as if nothing had ever happened or was wrong. I just rejoiced and thanked the Father for this miracle and went to Pat Skywalker on the head and spoke to him for about five minutes. I was ecstatic and full of joy for him because just hours ago he would have been considered clinically dead. By evening he was perched on a board at the highest point in his cage, a feat only a strong bird could climb to. Skywalker would not take any food on Monday, but he climbed everywhere and seemed to take water. Tuesday morning, no change, did not accept any food, just tasted it and spit it out. At 8.15 on Wednesday morning, I went to check on Skywalker and he was lying on his stomach. He had just passed away not much earlier. <clears throat> I was devastated and asked God, why, why, why? I petted his head as I knelt by him and apologized <clears throat> that I had not done more. And I wept over him. I was devastated and sobbed so hard and so long that I was weak and barely able to walk to my truck and drive to 30 miles to town. At Walmart, I picked up a replacement bottle of peroxide for my neighbor and while at the checkout, where one of the ladies had called me over to serve me, we got to talking and I broke down. She told me <clears throat> that, that God had promised never to give me more than I could bear. I thanked her for reminding me of that scripture. And while I was still crying, she came around and gave me a hug. I got a warm, caring hug from a total stranger and I thanked my father for her. After arriving home and unloading, I knelt beside Skywalker again and stroking that gorgeous white head Looking into his beautiful, fierce, white eyes, said, Skywalker, you are free. And I'll see you on that day when all creation will worship the Lamb. I then got up, dug a hole, and buried him. A few steps from your special place, I stopped, looked back, and said, You know, you will greatly enjoy soaring in the heights of your new sky, Skywalker. I love you dearly, and I'm truly grateful that God saw me worthy and trusting me with you. Isaiah 40, 28, 31 promises me that I too will one day soar on wings like an eagle. I'll be seeing you then. Skywalker, my heart, is, my heart is heavy, but I cannot allow it to break. You saw all the others God has sent me to help. They need me, and I must carry on with my destiny until the day Father says to me, well done, come on home. Your journey that I set before you has come to an end, and now you will start your new one. I must go on. It is now Wednesday, July 8th, and it is midnight. 
May the peace of God that passes all, all understanding be with me tonight <clears throat> as I try to go to sleep. This day, <clears throat> this day has been hard. Good night, Skywalker. God created you and said it was very good. Did you know in his word, he mentions eagles 34 times? He is truly in awe and proud of his creation of your species. I will now wear my eagle head necklace again in memory of you. God, please use this to draw people to yourself. Amen. Excuse me, I can't see anymore. Glasses are all fogged up. So why does this happen to me? It's only a few days. A few days involved with an animal. Just a few days. And yet there was a deep and powerful bond. That's Michael Scheibler. And that's the heart of this special refuge. I, I think only the Lord could bring together what's happened here. People themselves can't bring this together. Once this place got set up and the bears started coming, people started showing up from Europe. People started showing up, the Americans, some local people started showing up. And one day I was standing out in the lawn and I'm looking at 13 or so people that were in there and all of a sudden it hit me. I said, Father, only you. How are you? Hi. This is more than feeding wild animals. This is about taking a place of personal pain and turning it into a haven for healing. <laughs> there we go, buddy Koo. Yeah, I'm going to buddy Koo. Michael is living out his love for animals, and the animals have helped bring him healing as well. See, it wasn't, uh, I, I can't say like so many other testimonies I've heard that it was overnight. Just, wow, there was my life, this way and now it's this way. For me, it's still a work in progress. You know, you can get so busy that you totally miss the whole thing. God, you're bringing this together for a reason and a purpose. And if this is part of my destiny, then as long as it is, I want to walk in it. I don't have a clue where it's going, but I just take one day at a time, and wherever the Lord takes it, that's where we'll be, I guess. God, you, you really do care. From a dark past, Michael has found redemption. He's found a home for the animals and for himself. I don't care what people think. I'm not going to try to please people anymore because I realize I can't do it. If you want to come up with some negative, I can deal with that. You know, you're, you're not in my space. You haven't walked in my shoes to understand why I understand what I understand. That's okay. God bless you anyway. That's fine. It's an extraordinary journey, an extraordinary place, truly a sanctuary.